It is a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome you to the 2009 edition of the annual lecture, which is Harvard Divinity School's oldest named lecture, the Dudleyan. Um, let me say just a word about the Dudleyan before I introduce our, uh, our introducer. Um, a history of the Dudleyan lectures, uh, a historian Perry Miller said, uh, in his 1953 Dudleyan lecture that he gave, a history of the Dudleyan lectures is in fact an epitome of the entire um, modern intellect, at least as that intellect impinged upon Harvard. In 1953, it was easier to say that the American intellect impinged upon Harvard or Harvard upon the American intellect, obviously. Um, the lectureship was established in 1750 at the bequest of Paul Dudley, uh, 1675 to 1751, who graduated in 1690 from the college here. And this is a quote from Sibley's biographical sketches of graduates of Harvard University. Uh, he appears to have been a normal undergraduate with no unusual fines and only one large bill for broken glass, <laughs> according to a passage that he has there. Uh, and some of you may not have looked, as I have on occasion, at some of the old records of Harvard College, but a very typical thing was, uh, was the breaking of, of beer bottles and other, and other glass in times of, of riot or in times of anger with tutors or whatever else. It seemed to have been a, a perfectly normal occurrence, as far as I can tell from the archival record here. Uh, so I'm sure that's what they're referring to. There are certainly a number of cases of people being expelled for breaking bottles over others' heads and so forth. Um, so things were a little more exciting in the 18th century, in the 17th century, rather. In records relating to the Dudleyan lecture in Harvard University, President Josiah Quincy writes, The Honorable Judge Dudley says in his will, bearing date January 1st, 1750, Item, I give to Harvard College in Cambridge in New England 133 pounds, 6 shillings, and 8 pence in like money, that means lawful money, of course, to be appropriated and disposed of in such manner as I shall direct. We don't allow donors to do that anymore after they've given it. Under my hand and seal at any time thereafter. Judge Dudley signed his will as follows, in testimony of my humble desire that God would be graciously pleased to accept this poor thank offering from his unworthy servant for his many and great mercies to me in my education at the college and my sincere prayer and desire for the favor of God to that society in all ages to come. Justice Dudley had served both as Attorney General and as Chief Justice of Massachusetts despite his average record uh, here in the college. Many great thinkers, philosophers, and theologians have presented the lectures over the years. Um, I have a long list of many, but uh, let me just name a few from recent years. Uh, Gustavo Gutierrez uh, in 1984, Nicholas Voltestoff in uh, 1996, a little earlier, E.O. Wilson in 1991, Alistair McIntyre uh, in 1999, Syed Hossein Nasser in 2003, and Susanna Heschel in 2006. Last year, we had Professor Paul Roram present the lecture, and tonight we have the honor of hearing Professor Pilar Aquino, who is currently a visiting professor here at HDS, as most of you know. Um, I would like uh, to mention that uh, you see in front of you a wonderful uh, altar setting here, which I understand is due to a couple of our, of, our, uh, of our HDS students. And I wondered if one of you might say something about it. Uh, Maria Cristina, uh, or I'm sorry, who else is here? Oh, I'm sorry, good. Come, please come down and have, just say a word about that, and then we'll move to the lecture. Similarly, thank you very much. Now it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce my esteemed colleague, uh, the Stendhal Professor of Divinity, uh, Professor Elizabeth Schusle Fiorenza. Uh, Elizabeth will introduce the lecture, and will, it will be followed by questions. And I understand uh, that Similarly will also, in fact, have something for us at the very end as well. And then we will move, and I'll remind you now. Uh, we will move to the Brown Room for a reception at about 6.30. So please, Elizabeth. 
Good evening. <clears throat> I am very pleased and honored to introduce to you tonight uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Maria Pilar Aquino, who is Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of San Diego, and as we already have heard, is during this academic year um, visiting Professor of Theology here at Harvard Divinity School. Dr. Aquino is an internationally renowned uh, scholar. Uh, she is known for her pioneering work in Latin American theology and U.S. Latina feminist theologies of liberation. Uh, Dr. Aquino is the first woman born and raised in Mexico to earn a doctoral degree in theology. She is also the first Roman Catholic woman to receive the doctoral degree in theology from the Pontifical University of Salamanca in Spain. Professor Aquino is a co-founder of uh, the Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theologians of the United States and has served as its first woman president. Her work has been recognized by the University of Helsinki with an honorary doctorate in theology, an honor that recognizes her international status and ecumenical contributions. Dr. Aquino has published numerous substantive works in the fields of theology, ethics, and feminist studies in religion. In addition to her many journal essays and book chapters in Spanish and in English, she has authored several books that are widely known in Latina, uh, Latino theological studies. Let me just mention her signature works, Our Cry for Life, Feminist Theology from Latin America, A Reader in Latina Feminist Theology, Religion and Justice, and Feminist Intercultural Theology, Latina Explorations for a Just World. Professor Aquino has also co-edited uh, Theology, Expanding the Borders, In the Power of Wisdom, Feminist Spiritualities of Struggle, The Return of the Just War, and Reconciliation in a World of Conflicts. She is currently editing a book provisionally entitled Broken Bodies, Sacred Lives, Feminist Intercultural Theology on Women's Human Dignity and Sexuality. As these works indicate, Professor Aquino's research is centered in the areas of liberation theologies, social ethics, with a, special, uh, with a special focus on critical feminist theological method and hermeneutics. She also is working on two books, one on ethical visions and the other on feminist interventions in conflict and peace studies. Both works will greatly contribute to the area of sociopolitical ethics and the emerging fields of intercultural studies and social conflict studies including religious peace building and reconciliation. Finally, Professor Aquino serves both on national and international editorial boards of prominent theological journals. I'm especially grateful uh, for the work she has done on the editorial board of the Journal of Feminist Studies in Religion. On the basis of my work with her on various research projects over the years and in team teaching with her last semester, I can testify that Professor Aquino is a superb and wonderful colleague and teacher. It gives me great satisfaction that a Roman Catholic woman scholar was chosen this year to represent the best of Catholic, albeit not papist, theology <laughs> as the Lane lecturer. I'm looking forward to her lecture on globalization identity and religious peace building. Please welcome with me Dr. Maria Pilar Aquino. Let me say thank you first to Dean Graham and uh, thank you to Elizabeth for their generous words of uh, introduction.
I also want to thank Deans Karen Grundler Whitaker and Jane Idleman Smith for making my visit uh, to the Divinity School so enjoyable. And also, I want to thank the students uh, from both semesters who are making my visit also greatly meaningful and fruitful. I am grateful to everyone for attending this lecture and to my friends and colleagues who both honor me and grace us with their presence this evening. Brita Stendhal, Professors Mary Hines, Kuo Puilan, Sean Copeland, Marianne Hinsdale, Hoffman Ospino, Nancy Pineda, so several of my friends from other institutions are accompany, accompanying us this evening, and I'm very grateful uh, to you for being, for being here. I am particularly grateful to Professors Francis Chusle Fiorenza and Elizabeth Chusle Fiorenza for their tremendous support of my work over the years and for encouraging me to accept the invitation for this rewarding visiting professorship. I am indeed honored to be the Dutleyan lecturer this year and to follow in the footsteps of those scholars and intellectuals who have used and continue to use the power of religious knowledge and influence to promote mutual understanding and collaboration between the different religions of the world. Among my eminent predecessors as Dutleyan lecturers from the Roman Catholic tradition, Gustavo Gutierrez, as mentioned by Dean Graham, Johann Baptist Metz, and Cardinal Walter Casper have become widely known for their commitment to foster dialogue among diverse uh, uh, Christian churches and between the many world religions. In the same tradition of such commitment, I want to use this honor to explore a theme of great interest to the wider academy. And uh, this is a theme that is offering new opportunities for scholars of theological and religious studies to bring forth our constructive insights and knowledge in response to the deeper questions and concerns of humanity about itself and the world today. I propose to discuss the religious and theological relevance of peace building as an emerging field of study. With this, I am also seeking to honor the intent of the Dudleyan lecture that, as mentioned by Dean Graham uh, before, this year is dedicated to a theme contributing to enhance Protestant Catholic mutual understanding. I believe that religious peace building offers fruitful avenues to strengthen mutual understanding and collaborative interaction between Protestant and Catholics by sharing visions and practices to fashion together a more just world. I propose to discuss the religious and theological relevance of peace building for today's times by dividing my intervention into two sections. In the first section, from a critical analytical approach informed by interests of social justice, I address briefly the context of reality from which the field of uh, conflict transformation and peace building studies emerges and to which this field seeks to respond. In this context, I discuss globalization dynamics and identity conflicts in reference to the necessity of fashioning knowledge and social practices for both, supporting a constructive transformation of all forms of violent interaction, and restructuring just relationships and societal systems. In the second section, I am interested in discussing the opportunities and potential resources that religious actors and scholars of religion have for a creative intervention in collaborative efforts aimed at forging religious peace-building frameworks. In this section, I argue that active participation in religious peace-building initiatives allows one to engage in the process of 
changing the present so that we together give shape to a more hopeful and meaningful future. Becoming a part of this process entails that religious peace-building studies are constitutive of all theological and religious studies. So let me begin with my first section. I have called this section from the heart of divided societies. To speak about globalization in the context of today's global market capitalism is to speak about possible responses to the question, what type of society are we seeking to build? The act of asking about a desired future indicates a threefold presupposition. First, that the world shaped by today's global market capitalism is proving to be not only deeply dehumanizing due to its intensification of poverty and global inequalities, but also unsustainable for the majority of humans and the environment. Second, that in the present historical context of divided societies, rather than asserting the intractability of fragmentation and sectarianism, the plural social actors and movements committed to social change are called to assert shared values and compatible aims for a more just world. Third, that recognizing the active involvement of religion in maintaining human and social divisions for centuries, today's massive reality of global injustice and destructive conflicts demands from religion active participation in peace-building processes in the interest of justice and peace. Promoting human rights, meeting human needs, and creating, creating sustainable environments are not priority items in the agenda of current global capitalism. In fact, those are not items at all. As noted by Harvard economist Professor Amartya Sen, quote, there is considerable evidence that global capitalism is typically much more concerned with markets than with, say, establishing democracy or expanding public education or enhancing social opportunities of the underdogs of society, end of quote. In the current phase of global capitalism called oligopoly market structure ruled by the financial corporations, the interests and needs of the larger human population finds no place at the table. An oligopoly market system is a way of constructing social reality in which only a few, oligopoly, only a few, elite social actors associated to selected firms concentrate products, investment, consumer goods, trade, essential resources, and so forth in such a way that while everyone else is excluded from participation in decision-making, those firms establish great collaboration among themselves to access the greatest profit according to their market share. This is a world marked by a high level of competition between firms for positions of dominance and control in the global setting. According to two-thirds world social analysts, in particular social scientists from uh, Latin America, those associated to the Department of uh, Ecumenical Investigations, Jose, San Jose, Costa Rica, for those of you who know uh, uh, along the, uh, the lines of the work of uh, Franz Hinkelammert and economists and theologians who work together in this type of approach. The current phase of global capitalism, with its dramatic financial crisis, caused by irresponsible decisions of the greedy, speculative financial sector, is resulting in deteriorating conditions, not just for the poor of the Southern Hemisphere, but for everyone else excluded from shaping the face of the world. The human aspirations for sustainable environments to meet basic human needs and promote human rights 
become once again asphyxiated by focus on corporate profit. This is a significant source of conflict that cannot be resolved by rescuing banks through leaving marginalized people in greater precarious circumstances and continuing to increase levels of social instability and human insecurity around the world. This is taxpayers' money, as you know. Systemic social, in social injustice multiplies a pervasive reality of conflict as massive inequalities become key factors in deepening social divisions. As defined by conflict transformation scholar Louis Kriesberg, social conflict involves the interaction of groups of people whose goals, interests, and values are sensed or perceived to be mutually exclusive, exclusive mutually incompatible. Social conflict is about issues, he says, that involve deep-rooted human needs. While it is true that conflict as an inherent dynamic of human life is not necessarily destructive, in that poverty and deprivation do not necessarily result in destructive violence, it is also true that destructive conflict is deeply influenced by persistent social neglect, human insecurity, and by unmet basic human needs. Therefore, in my understanding, conflict becomes the link between the current model of global market capitalism and peace building. Taking 1989 as a symbolic year to mark the end of the Cold War with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the settling of market capitalism as the do dominant societal model at world scale, for the past 20 years, instead of entering into a new era of harmony and prosperity for humanity and the world, violent conflicts have ravaged the face of the earth in every corner. We have witnessed unspeakable tragedies and atrocities beyond comprehension that uh, challenge any standard of rationality. In many of them, religious rhetoric has been present, whether as a cultural background, as a component, or as a motive of the confrontations. To illustrate this deplorable era, the extent and pervasiveness of conflict situations include genocide, massacres, forced disappearances, arbitrary executions, indiscriminate assassinations, massive amputations, unjustified wars and military invasions, humanitarian crises, grave violations of human rights, torture inflicted on others for mere amusement and pleasure. Who can forget about Abu Ghraib? I'm hoping that we never forget. Systematic rape of women used as a weapon of war. Suppression of international law in crimes against humanity. All these conflict situations have appeared simultaneously, incremented, and multiplied around the planet. These are not isolated incidents, but patterns of human interaction based on hate, intolerance, resentments, prejudice, hostility, and dehumanization, which are related to power dynamics seeking domination or to social dynamics seeking justice for asserting human rights and meeting basic human needs. Dynamics of social divisions and violence influence conceptual and social practices of what Mark Gopin and other peace-building scholars call a negative identity by which people's sense of the self is defined against an actual or an imagined enemy. By inducing global inequalities, deprivation of basic human needs, 
basic human insecurity and unjust access to resources, today's environment induces conditions leading people to fashion threatening enemies as a historical and a, an existential necessity. It also, but it also reduces people's capacities to deal with human differences as opportunities to build together conditions to reach people's shared aspirations of justice and well-being. This is an environment in which conflict becomes the link between marginalized identities and capitalist globalization. In this environment, however, constructing the personal and collective self through dynamics of the humanizing people in reference to an imagined or personified enemy is not historically inevitable as social actors interact for the purpose of changing conditions of asymmetry and marginalization. Conceptualizing difference and diversity in terms of annihilating competition or polarizing aspirations is not the single choice available to marginalized social groups. The ideology of demonizing and dehumanizing social groups on the basis of identity categories or cultural or religious singularity both need to be replaced by creative conceptualizations that support our shared humanity in social, political, and in explicit religious terms. From the Mennonite religious ethical framework, a world-recognized pioneer of peace-building studies, John Paul Lederach, asserts that conflict transformation is a perspective that, quote, understands peace as embedded in justice. It emphasizes the importance of building right relationships in the social structures through radical respect for human rights and life. Conflict transformation is a comprehensive orientation or framework that ultimately may require a fundamental change in our ways of thinking. End of quote. My suggestion to you is that peace building is a powerful venue to enhance positive identities uh, as, as it allows one to continue developing theories and practices aimed at overcoming systemic social injustice and at the same time changing radically our ways of thinking. From the heart of divided societies, rather than placing oneself as a competing adversary in the struggle for social and political recognition within the shrinking distribution policies of the status quo, peace building emerges as a constructive path to understand oneself personally and collectively in terms of interdependence, partnership, connectedness, and solidarity as shared, shared values to affirm that a future of justice together is possible in this world. Also, from the heart of divided societies, as I take a look at communities here and around the world, I find that in many ways, in many languages, and in many voices, not necessarily through speech though, this affirmation is being made by people everywhere who become peacemakers as their way to respond to the calamities of violence in their homes and in their communities. There is a whole universe of experiences out there embodied by women and men of religious intervention in conflict transformation and peace building that often unheard by the academy and the wider world are fostering new religious interpretations and, theori and theoretical practices for a new world of justice and peace. For religious actors and scholars of religion, becoming a part of this universe to learn more 
to systematize and make visible those experiences offers us new intellectual paths. With that, let me move on to the second section uh, that I have called the relevance of religious peace building. From many academic disciplines, approaches to the contemporary dynamics of conflict are increasingly acknowledging that religion has been and continues to be an important factor in conflicts, especially in terms of shaping human identities and societal systems. The introduction to the recent book, Peacemakers in Action, edited by a pioneer of religious peace building, HDS professor David Little, asserts that, quote, today, it is widely accepted that religion is a cause rather than a solution to many of the world's violent conflicts. This should not be surprising. The majority of contemporary conflicts involve issues of religious, national, or ethnic identity. And religious teaching are being used to legitimize wars in all forms of brutality and violence, end of quote. In this slide, I cannot fail to note that in spite of this situation, while scholars from a variety of other academic fields are strongly engaged in the task of studying the intervention of religion in international peace building, scholars of religion and theology have insufficiently addressed the actual and potential contribution of religion to conflict transformation through frameworks of religious peace building. According to Mohammed Abu Nimer and Drew Christensen, this situation needs to change. I believe that concerns about the constructive intervention of religions in processes of conflict involve not only concerns about the immediate response to the calamities of, of a military power in war, which are crucial indeed, but also the larger concerns about the present and future of humanity and the world. Persistent poverty global inequalities, pervasive neglect of basic human needs for the majority of the world's population, violence against women in other marginalized social groups, internalized ideologies of hate and dehumanization, and environmental degradation are inescapable realities that keep in focus the question raised for religious actors. What type of society are we seeking to build? What kind of a future do we envision for ourselves and others around the world? Possible response to these questions presuppose that religious actors are able to bring into consciousness and make explicit that for which one is working or that which gathers one's aspirations and provides orientation to one's endeavors. Where are we heading to? What do we want? What, what are we looking for? Writing books, teaching, being in the classroom. What are we, what are we doing? What do we want to achieve? John Paul Lederach asserts that this is important. Because in peace-building processes, quote, if we do not know where we're going, it is difficult to get there. <laughs> End of quote. <laughs> to me, the point of this idea is simple. One needs to give an account of where we are and where we are going from here. In this light, I suggest that from today's context of destructive conflict and massive misery caused by global capitalism, if religion is to contribute to the restructuring of the world in constructive ways, religious actors can and should devise conceptual and social practices for intervention in conflict transformation and for working together to fashion paths conducive to a desired future 
of justice and peace. As noted by Lederach, transformation provides a clear and important vision because it brings into focus the horizon towards which we journey. The building of healthy relationships and communities locally and globally. This approach is compatible with the frameworks of a critical feminist theology of liberation and with other liberation theologies as they pursue aims of personal and systemic transformation in the interest of justice and liberation. According to a pioneer of feminist liberation theology, Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza, the criterion to evaluate a theological framework, quote, is not orthodoxy or doctrinal statements, but its ability to transform theological and religious mindsets of alienation, low self-esteem, and subordination, end of quote. To me, the religious pursuit of new models of society, culture, and religion from the heart of today's world involves explicit engagement in processes of peace building. Prominent scholars in the field are consistent in saying that as a framework of thought and action designed to respond constructively and creatively to conflict situations, peace building is virtually synonymous with conflict transformation. Bringing together various insights from peace building scholars who give attention to faith based communities, such as John Paul Lederach, Lisa Search, and Cynthia Sampson, my understanding of peace building connects the what, the how, and the what for or purpose of this framework in the following terms. Peace building is a dynamic process involving a multiplicity of interdependent actors, approaches, aspirations, functions, and activities that working simultaneously at different levels of community and society pursue initiatives deliberately fashioned to transform constructively all forms of violent interaction by restructuring just relationships and social systems and by building conditions and capacities for societies that affirm human dignity through meeting basic human needs and protecting human rights within sustainable environments. In light of this understanding, religious actors involved in peace building not only include those people who are working in the actual setting of deadly confrontations, but also those people who work, as mentioned by David Little, in the Scott Appleby, quote, as legal advocates for religious, for a religious human rights, scholars conducting research relevant to cross-cultural and interreligious dialogue, and theologians and ethicists within religious communities who are probing and strengthening their traditions of nonviolence, end of quote. Scholars of religion and theology contribute to restructure our deeply wounded world by articulating in religious terms visions, values, and resources of religion conducive to support peace building as a common ground for justice and peace. For, from the setting of one's own religious tradition, one engages in developing interpretive frameworks and practices that promote cultural, religious, personal, relational, structural, and systemic change aligned to web visions and values of justice and peace. Whether engaged through the lens of disciplinary methods proper of one's academic field of study, such as systematics, sacred scriptures, ethics, historical studies of religion, ministry studies, religious leadership, or other, other sciences of religion, or approach to through the lens of intervention categories, such as observation and witness, education and formation, 
advocacy and empowerment, conciliation and mediation, conscientization and grassroots organizing, scholars of religion become, become involved in the dynamics of peace building as interdependence links the future and faith of our own humanity to the humanity of others around the world. In my view, religious peace building is necessary even when religion is not the primary cause of violent conflict. Religious actors who seek articulation of religious peace building frameworks understand that this is a clearly relational, interdependent, and a committed task. The basis of this understanding is twofold. On the one hand, religious systems are built upon a commonality of guiding principles and values which are regarded to be universal. Many scholars and activists and policy makers have recognized that teachings about compassion, kindness, tolerance, justice, peace, human dignity, and reverence for life cannot be claimed by any single religious tradition because these are values taken to be proper of the human as human. Nonetheless, as argued by professors David Little and Donald Sweater, one needs to take into account that although social groups do not necessarily need a religious reason to seek to preserve and promote certain attributes or aims, in all cultural contexts, those groups that authenticate themselves through religious rhetoric are most likely to strengthen and intensify their purposes. On the other hand, no longer religious traditions can claim innocence or ignorance about the deeply damaging consequences of adopting religious dogmatism or doctrinal absolutism in the way they relate to themselves, to others, and to the world. Attitudes of hatred, exclusion, and intolerance have been some of the most common effects of religious absolutism. But a sense appears to be growing, indicating that no singular religious tradition or theological framework can claim to be the exclusive source of meaning for personal and, so, and communal self-understanding. That is why today, from the perspective of liberation theologies and religious peace building, the plurality of discursive religious practices entail awareness of and commitment to those approaches that serve the interests of global justice, human rights, peace, and the integrity of creation. The task of articulating theoretical and practical approaches to religious peace building entails giving critical attention not only to the conflict dynamics at work within the current circumstances, but also at the goal and the process of getting from one point to the other. Envisioning a different future of well-being for all in the setting of sustainable environments demands from religious actors to give an intelligent account of why religious initiatives, initiatives are necessary and useful for conflict transformation. Approaches to conflict transformation allows one to envision new opportunities for contributing from plural religious environments to assert mutually shared goals through intervention in collaborative terms. Social dynamics of collaboration not only reject competition as a way of life, but also affirms useful theories and creative practices that support the actualization of religious visions, values, and goals based on justice and peace. Focused on transformation for constructive change, a religious peace-building framework accepts the premise that peace-building is not a task conducive to pacification within the parameters of the status quo, 
but rather it is a dynamic process taking place at multiple levels of intervention in which a multiplicity of actors share interdependent activities to effect transformation in the pursuit of a renewed humanity and the integrity of creation. Devising together means and resources to respond in religious terms to the crisis of a wounded humanity and world, religious actors embrace change as a compatible aim. Religious traditions and institutions cannot alone provide the necessary responses to the deep and wide magnitude of broken relationships due to destructive conflict and violence, but together we may find great opportunities to sustain the common good. Drawing wisdom and insight from the core emancipating dynamics of religions, collaborative efforts open the path for religious actors to affirm that a shared future of justice and well-being is possible. In terms of conceptualizing religious peace building, it is important for me to note that religious intervention in conflict transformation does not stand on its own as a new intellectual current isolated from developments in the wider society and academy. As an emerging framework of thought and action, religious peace building must be conceptualized within the traditions of peace and justice studies and be aligned with the religious, social, ethical, and political frameworks of liberation. To me, the link between religious peace-building frameworks and other religious and socio-ethical frameworks is defined by the simplest and more crucial of all realities. People, especially those people whose daily life is a heavy burden to carry, that is, the majority of the world's population in whose unjust suffering is increased by the destructive violence and reinforced by the privation of the basic means to sustain human well-being. Having people at the center, especially those who struggle to change the root causes and effects of destructive conflict and violence, is characteristic of relevant religious responses that have emerged in the second half of the 20th century. The work for a just society and a sustainable world in response to unjust human suffering has been at the core of both Latin American liberation theologies and feminist theologies of liberation. For these theologies, the struggles of religious actors and social movements to change the conditions of oppression and, social and, and marginalization provide the grounds for contributing theologies and practices supportive of conflict transformation. It is important for me to know that for three reasons. First, based on my knowledge of the literature, which I maintain current in various Western languages, I have reached the conclusion that while other scholars, particularly those from the social, the political sciences, and law, are strongly engaged in the study of religion, conflict, violence, and peace building, scholars of religion are notably absent from this field of study. In terms of explicit approaches to religious peace building as such, a few books have been published addressing issues related to religious resources for social transformation, interreligious dialogue, reconciliation, and peace building. But in general, an explicit approach to religious peace building by experts in the sciences of religion and theology remains weak. So it's very true, as we have seen in the, since this past semester in the classroom, those, when those of you who have been taking the classes know. So we go to the books and we start to look for concepts in, in theological religious understandings. Those who write on those issues are not people in the field of religion and theology, period. 
So yes, there are two books out there, book chapters out there, not written by people in religion. It is sociologists, historians, psychologists, people in law, and so For me, it is significant to note that it is the social scientists who are taking seriously the ethical and political dimensions and implications of core religious terms such as forgiveness, reconciliation, evil, healing, justice, truth, peace, reparations, restoration, memory, and so forth. These scholars are redefining the meaning of these terms from the young academic discipline called transitional justice. If religion and theology are our fields of expertise, I believe that we can and should do more to keep ourselves in tune with these developments by contributing to the field in a more decisive way. If people and the world are to have any epistemological weight in our endeavors. A critical conversation with the scholars of other sciences is necessary. Second, my reading of the works on religion and conflict by scholars of religion, the majority of whom I, loca I located in the U.S., appears to indicate that they have found the religious relevance of destructive conflict and violence only in the past two decades, and notably in relation to Islam and religious violence. I believe that this is wrong, and that this wrong must be corrected. From the early works of Dom Helder Camara, 1971, to the works of Otto Maduro in the early 80s on the spiral of violence and religion and social conflict with those titles, Latin American liberation theologians have been dealing with these issues for nearly 60 years in the context of the U.S.-sponsored military dictatorships throughout the continent and the Caribbean. Also, Conf conflict and peace building studies today appear to be severely affected by sexism due to their curiarchal frameworks of thought. As increasingly growing feminist approaches to peace building and conflict information shows, the struggles of women continue in every part of the world to change poverty, sexual violence, abuse, and subordination. The significant contribution of women peacemakers are only beginning to be recognized. Many of those studies, however, also disregard or choose to ignore the intervention of feminist liberation theologians on issues of religion, conflict, and violence by providing critical interpretations in religious resources in terms of justice and liberation. This intervention has been taking place for decades. Fifteen years ago, in 1994, Sean Copland and Elizabeth Joseph Lorenza together provided an insightful religious approach to violence against the women. Then, in the same year, a historical event convened by the Women's Commission of the Ecumenical Association of Third World Theologians, 45 women theologians from every continent came together, including Elizabeth, Puilan, eh, eh, myself, I don't remember if Sean was there, but we got together in the city of San Jose, Costa Rica, to assert in religious terms our commitment to the transformation of all structures of violence and domination. A critical conversation with feminist scholars of religion and of other sciences is necessary. So there is work that has been done, but sometimes, that's my impression, sometimes the scholars in the, you know, right in the, at the setting of universities kind of uh, not very much in touch with what is going on around the world, think that they are, they are reinventing the wheel. That is not the case. We need to become more aware of other developments, bring, enrich ourselves with conversation with other developments out there in the world. The significant uh, contribution of other people must be taken into account. Third, in today's context in which religions dispute the dominance of worldviews, 
about the present and future of the world and humanity, advocates, advocates of religious orthodoxy and dogmatic absolutism deny the possibility of religions coming together to share common visions and goals. However, religious actors and activists committed to justice, peace, and human rights are providing, proving, proving that communities of, val of values and aims is indeed possible and even useful for the restoration of communities. The pursuit of a just, reconciled, and a sustainable world is bringing together a multiplicity of religious actors who assert interdependent and collaborative perspectives to transform relationships and societies. Faith-based communities increasingly find that this pursuit sustains processes in which religions and spiritualities are discovered to bring people in common. And for, to, for me to assert that, I have in mind at least, at least six inst instances which are proving that contributions can be done in common. The Council for the Parliament of the World Religions, the Catholic Peace Building Network, the World Conference of Religions for Peace, the Religion and Peacemaking Program of the United States Institute of Peace, from which Professor David Little comes and the International, the International Committee for the Peace Council, and the international articulation of the World Social Forum. It's very much alive. A critical conversation with international organizations and initiatives of the religions of the world is also necessary. We need to become connected with those developments. As I bring my intervention to a close, my hope is that you will join me in seeing signs everywhere, revealing that today hope in a different future is stronger than ever. The system globalizing poverty and war is falling apart before our own eyes. New world powers are rising and soon will raise new challenges. But for the women and men of faith-based communities, we hope and work for a sustainable future in a renewed creation. Religion peace building becomes a life-saving path that goes through and beyond any dead giving system. However, situations of destructive conflict and violence will not go away soon, at least not during our lifetime. And this is true not only because poverty and environmental instability are growing, but also because the only industry that remains quite healthy is the weapons industry. Among the G8 countries controlling global arms sales, the U.S. continues to be the largest supplier of weapons, and more than 70% is going to the two-thirds world to countries which, in which violation of human rights is persistent. For now, being in the midst of a turbulent world, religious actors and institutions are faced with the necessity of continuing to devise meaningful and useful resources to respond effectively to situations of conflict and violence. It is true that academic resources to study religious peace building are in the process of being constructed just as the broader fields of conflict transformation, peace building, and transitional justice studies are increasingly being recognized as constitutive of any academic curriculum that seeks to prepare students to deal creatively and constructively with most significant and pressing concerns. These are the concerns that affect us today and tomorrow. Engaging the processes of giving shape to religious peace building as a field of study means that one is choosing to become an active participant to change the present so that we together give shape to a more hopeful and meaningful future. 
conceptual articulations of this promising field entail that one is deeply connected to the religious experiences of persons and communities whose aspirations and struggles are aimed at protecting human dignity by meeting hum basic human needs, promoting human rights, and affirming sustainable environments. Institutional support of religious peace-building studies, I suggest, can be justified by a set of five criteria. One, consistency based on shared religious values. This is the most reasonable, intelligent, and adequate response to the challenges of today's reality. Second, urgency. Response to human suffering and environmental calamities does have religious priority. Reality itself demands it. Three, necessity. Transformation of relationships in societal systems must be done if humanity and the world are to be preserved. Fourth, usefulness. Students of religion develop or enhance capacities and skills for effective intervention in situations of conflict and violence. That's the world that we're going to have, we're going to meet. Fifth, opportunity. This is a time, this is the world that we as humans have this is the opportunity that we have, and this is a precious space to bring together the wealth of wisdom and resources that we, that the religions of the world have for constructive intervention in the service of a better future for all. I hope that this Tadleian lecture will be a small but an invigorating contribution to the efforts of making religious peace building studies a constitutive part of the curriculum, not only for ministry studies, but for all theological and religious studies. Let's take charge of our future. Thank you. Five minutes. Okay. Thank you so very much. It appears that we have five minutes for comments, react, which is great, I think. We're just taking any opportunity that we have. So this is great. I would like to invite you for comments, reactions, additions. Uh, yes. Yes, 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 of course, yes, of course, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, of course, that is absolutely important. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking there is a contribution done by a friend of mine who is the head of the, um, the uh, Office of, um, a, of uh, Policy in World Security, Dr. Tapio Kanin, and Dr. Tapio Kanin, I had the opportunity of working with him in a project. It was about uh, five years ago, and then I, we, we, we met again at the University of San Diego, the, the Kroc Institute of Peace and Justice, and uh, he is one of the um, persons highly committed to bring together people in religion and those working in uh, uh, global issues related to security, policy making and the presence of the uh, UN in situations of, uh, affected by conflict and violence. So yes, it, it, to me one of the greatest challenges is that we the religion people are not that, uh, we need more skills, more capacity, more training, we need more knowledge. The mere knowledge of uh, religious rhetoric all by itself without support of knowledge of how, how the, world, the world works, makes it, it puts us in a very weak position. So I believe that in terms of international uh, 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 organizations, centers, institutions, governmental offices, and so forth, are looking for people who know religion from the inside and who can also explain what is happening and devise methods and strategies. We're lacking the methods and the strategies for uh, a, a providing a, a solutions better 
research. However, let me qualify what I'm saying by, by saying that, that it is true. Academically, I believe that we need to expand our ways of, uh, of uh, training ourselves in terms of conflict information and peace building. But on the other hand, I, I also know everywhere around the world you will find peacemakers, grassroots people. They are doing the work. In, think about the countries. Think about all the countries affected by, by conflict and violence. So what do we need to do? I believe that we must be there. Learn from them. Uh, uh, the field is not done. We, we can contribute to give it, to, to shape it. And we will do that by doing that, by raising theories and conceptualizations on the basis of what we learn, with the people is the people who are inventing their own methods. So I'm hoping that, I mean, my hope is that we will become better, you know, better trained and more, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, with more resources and tools to engage uh, at the level of policy making. Uh, Professor Susie Ferenc knows I mean, in many, many, many uh, uh, meetings, that is my point. That's always my point over and over and over. We need to train ourselves to uh, affect societies in, in, in a different way, and especially thinking about policy making. We need to get to that level. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, if you could just elaborate a little bit on one of the points you made during your lecture. Uh, you said that religious peace building is necessary even when it is not a primary cause in the conflict. Correct. And if uh, you, could give one or, you could give one or two examples. That Correct. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, it has been said that uh, religion uh, 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 is a part or, or a, an important component of uh, processes of conflict. Uh, I just want to avoid uh, the impression or developing the idea that religious peace building is necessary only in the context of broken societies, only in the conflict of armed conflict. Uh, it, it, it is a, 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 an understanding within a, the, the world of uh, religion. Peace is not just the absence of what? Uh, yeah, so it is, it is along those lines that our societies are, as a matter of fact, involved in, 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 in dynamics of violence and conflict. We do not need to be, I mean, uh, uh, the situation that we have here is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, related to what um, uh, uh, young, uh, Johan Galton will say, negative peace. Yeah, we don't have war here, you know. The U.S. prefers to export the wars somewhere else. This is not, so, so the peace, so, so we need Peace building, even when we are not engaged in context of war. Peace building education and process are needed. One last question or comment, and then. <laughs> I, I wonder whether you might say uh, where maybe one or two examples of religious peace building that give you the most hope for the future. We were talking, or, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Susan. We were talking earlier in my class. I had a class from three to five. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, we had a guest speaker, Professor Kimberly Tydon from the anthropology department in the, here of Harvard. And uh, she, a wonderful, wonderful scholar. She specializes in conflict situations uh, in Peru and now in Colombia. So she's one of our, Harvard has great, great uh, people. Uh, uh, giving us, yeah, insights and things. So Professor Tyron, I just, you know, I, I came to um, uh, meet with her, and she was there. So we, and she has uh, written on the uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission of Peru. So we were talking about the contributions of the commission. And, uh, and some of the most hopeful, hopeful um, uh, initiatives that uh, we find there, Guatemala, Peru, the views that they have about a restoration and the involvement of religion in those processes. I mean, do give. A, a, a Colombia, in Colombia, a, we have the initiatives on uh, peace building um, programs to work with uh, a people affected by the conflict in Colombia. I'm also thinking of the University of Peace, Costa Rica, but, 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 uh, but just as I'm mentioning those uh, settings and examples, uh, as we know, experiences in Asia, uh, Africa, 
And then, believe it or not, I'm just mentioning this for those of you interested. We can do more research uh, later. <laughs> Tokyo. In Tokyo, Japan, initiatives exploring great, I mean, advancing a great deal of uh, concern and thinking on uh, peace building in conflict information, Tokyo, Japan. So I think that those are hopeful, you know, things. I, New Zealand, same thing. So I think that we have centers, institutions, concerns, and thank you so much. So I would like to invite, thank you, I would like to invite uh, uh, Semeli so that we have the um, singing of Amazing Grace as a symbol of a celebration of Thanksgiving and also uh, uh, rec recognition of the struggles of others. And this is in the Navajo language. Okay. Semeli, please. We have more to thank even than our lecturer. Uh, thank you, Simile. Uh, let me invite you again, everyone there. It will be refreshments and a chance, I think, to talk with our lecturer after such a wonderful presentation down in the brown room at the end of the hall. If you go out to the right and just go as far as you can go to the north, you will get there, okay? <laughs> so, uh, Professor Aquino, thank you again very, very much for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.